My name is Lori Severson, and I'm president of the Dinah Chamber of Commerce and Explore Dinah. And I'd like to welcome all of the chamber members, the Dinah Morningside Rotary, and um, the Edina uh, Rotary Club of, or the Rotary Club of Edina, to our event today. Um, for those of you who do not know, this is an annual event for us to partner with the Rotary Clubs. And what we do is we take all of the proceeds from this event and we pool it, and then we have a social activity um, with the two Rotary Clubs. And this year, the event will be held on April 22nd here at Edina Country Club. So I want you to kind of watch in all of your communications materials for more information on that. But I certainly hope to see you at that event. Um, I'd also like to let you know about an, an event that we have coming up next Tuesday. It's to help kick off one of our new initiatives at the Chamber, our well-being project called Green Umbrella. And you may have seen an article in last or this past Sunday Star Tribune uh, really kind of announcing that program. Uh, Mayor Hovland will be joining us, along with Mark Ritchie, who is president of Global Minnesota, and they will be helping us kick off the program and telling you some more details about what we have going on with Green Umbrella. But that's this coming Tuesday back here at Edina Country Club for breakfast, so I hope to see you back here. Before I turn it over to Scott Neal, I'd like to thank New Spaces for sponsoring today's program. Uh, but we have some fun activities for today, as well as some very informational um, programming. So Scott Neal, our city manager, I'd like to turn it over to you for today's event. And thank you all again for being here. Appreciate it very much. Well, before we begin uh, our program today, I want to introduce some of the elected officials that are in the audience today. Uh, let's first start with Franzen. Melissa is state senator. Melissa. We have Mayor Hovland, and we have Ron Anderson, our council member, and Mary Brindle from City Council. And from the school, and from the school board, we have Eric Allenberg, Janie Shaw, and Julie Green, and Lenny. <laughs> and Lenny Friedman. Well, Lenny is here too. He's not on my list, but but, uh, but thank thank you for joining us, Lenny. 2020 is an election year, and, and uh, many people think it's going to be one of our most uh, divisive in, in this country's history. While there are undoubtedly lots of uh, political views in the world, and certainly some in this room today, uh, we hope that we can set those aside uh, for at least an hour uh, as we learn things what, about what's going on with our local governments in Edina. And if there's going to be any feuding going on, let's make it fun. And now it's time for Friendly Feud, a battle of our civic organizations. We have two teams today. One team representing the Edina Chamber of Commerce. Let's have them join us right here. Meg Chido, Peter Seidman, Margaret Johnson, and Skip Thomas. And their competitors today is the Rotary Team. And the Rotary Team consists of Mr. Tom Gump, Shelly Loberg, Paul Nelson, and Josh Sprague. Will you come join us today, please? <laughs> Sit down. All right. So throughout today's uh, presentation, these teams are going to battle for civic organization supremacy in Edina. Uh, our, our rules are going to our rules for the game today are going to deviate some from the game that you've seen for so many years on TV at home. Uh, the behavior of the host is going to deviate a lot from uh, what you've seen in previous hosts. Uh, the city posted a survey online a few weeks ago, or excuse me, a few months ago, and got the top answers to a number of questions that you're going to see today. So for each one of these questions, the teams will send one person to the buzzer, just like on TV, right you see here. The first person who buzzes in gets the question. And if they get, some, if they get a response that's on the board, they win that and they, their team gets to kind of go through the, the process, right? And if they, they, get, uh, they get up to three incorrect answers, just like on TV, 
And if they, and if they get three incorrect answers without uh, exhausting the list of possible responses, then the other team, probably these guys, uh, get a chance to steal for all the points, right? And we're not going to compete, we're not going to calculate points on a per question basis like you see on TV. Doing math in front of these many, this many people is uncomfortable for, for some of us. So uh, if for the entire question, they're all worth 20 points. And you'll kind of, you'll see how this goes when we move forward. Okay. So let's start with our first question. And let me have the two contestants join me at the table. I have in my hand the questions. Question number one. What is your, the best response to this question? When you think of a Dinah, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Tom Gump. Best snow plowing in the world. <laughs> best snow plowing in the world. I, I'll take a moment, I'll take a moment at this point to tell you that the responses you're going to see aren't necessarily true, or the responses you hear from these uh, contestants aren't necessarily true. This one happens to be true, but m a lot of them won't be true. But let's see if that one's on the board, Tom. Give me best snow plowing in the wor world? In the world. In the yeah, world. In the best snow plowing in the universe. Yeah. Are you there? Oh. OK. So Skip, you got it. You don't have to answer another question. This is we're, oh, this verified rules. You got it here. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Did we win? You haven't won yet, Peter. Okay. Thank you. All right, Margaret. When you think of a Dinah, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Hockey. Hockey. Give me hockey. Hockey is number answer number four. Meg Chido, when you think of a Dinah, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Shopping. Shopping. Give me shopping. No, I am shocked. That should be there. Okay. Uh, Peter, what comes to mind? First thing, top of mind, Edina, what do you think right now? What? what well, is it? I'm going to tell you, but there's a policeman over there. I'm going to say speed trap. Speed. We <clears throat> okay. I'm going to, I'm going to help, I'm going to help Peter with this one. We call that speed enforcement. Speed enforcement. Is speed enforcement up here? It is not. Cake. Cake. Is cake on the board? Give me cake. Cake is number one. Cake, cake eater. Nice, nice job for a life longer. Right. Margaret, first thing, what comes to mind? Great schools. Great schools. Oh, great schools. Great schools has got to be there. Yeah. Number three, great schools is on the board. You got two strikes. You got Meg Chido. This could be trouble. What is it going to be? Okay, well, this is what I told my CEO when he first came to my company, and he moved from California, and he said, Edina stands for every day I need attention. Is that your response? Yeah, okay. attention. <laughs> every day I need attention. I wonder if that's on the board. No, it's not, Meg. I'm sorry. Okay, now. Now you get a chance. Southfield Mall. Southdale Mall. When you think of a diner, what's the first thing that comes? Southdale Mall. That? It's not? Oh, sorry. That means the points go to... Yeah, right? Yeah, okay, right, right, right. All right. So, um, as you heard, one of, the, one of the responses up here is schools. And uh, there's no better there's nobody better to talk about, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's nobody better to talk about our schools than our superintendent, uh, John Schultz. John's been in, in uh, oh, you're, okay, you're gonna read this with me? No, go ahead, go ahead. I'll just have you. Uh, John's been uh, an educator for 30, he says he's been an educator for 30 years, uh, most of them in the Hopkins School District. Uh, as a ninth grade science teacher, principal intern, K through 12 district science coordinator, uh, but he's been our superintendent in Edina for three years. He brings a strong background in achievement, fiscal stewardship, facilities management, equity leadership. For the past three years, he's been focused on bringing collaborative leadership uh, to the strategic plan. And he's going to talk about the strategic plan today. Please welcome John Schultz. Thanks, buddy. 
Am I? I'm on? Okay, good. Um, so uh, I can think of about 8,510 reasons why schools should be the first thing that comes to mind when people think of Edina, because we have amazing students. Uh, Edina students are achieving, they're succeeding, uh, they're serving and leading in schools and in the community. Our social media channels feature award-winning teams all the time and individuals nearly every day. And every day at every school, there are students who are quietly accomplishing personal academic milestones and providing leadership in their classrooms and schools. So, um, our uh, National Merit Scholars are among the highest scoring students of the 1.5 million in the country who take the PSAT. And then I want to feature our National Merit Reception here because it is one of my favorite events. While we gather to honor these amazing students, each student honors uh, one of their teachers. Each of the 42 scholars invited a teacher who has had an impact on their academic success. When they came forward to accept their certific certificate, the students took the mic and talked about their honored teacher. They talked about how their teachers inspired them, opened them up to new ways of thinking, and new subjects helped them persevere. And every one of them talked about the special relationship they have had with their honored teacher. Our staff is amazing too, and the inspiration and encouragement and the relationship teachers and staff nurture with their students make all the difference in the success of our students. So Edina students leave ready for the next phase of their academic journeys, and many leave with college credits in hand. Edina High School offers 25 AP courses in addition to many other opportunities for increased challenge and rigor. When our students apply to colleges and universities, this hard work pays off. The ACT College Readiness Reports this last year had Edina High School graduates posted the higher average AC sco ACT scores than previous years in all subjects. The scores in English and reading were the highest we've had in five years. More than 95% of last year's graduating class participated in ACT testing and more than 70% of them met college benchmarks in every subject. So in a high achieving district like Edina, uh, we continue to raise the bar by committing to a continuous improvement throughout the school district. And a significant indication of that has been the development of a strategic plan and it's a process for the leadership to look back where we have been, assessing where we are, and creating a vision for where we want to be in the future. The school board recently approved some key elements of the new strategic plan and implementation steps are in development now. Uh, but I just want to give you a little high level overview of what those plans look like. Um, first of all, uh, Academic excellence is uh, front and center in our strategic plan. And one of the things that's neat about this strategic plan and it's really encouraging for me is to partner with our students and talk to our students, get their voice into this. And I just want to add, um, in this community, you should know, your Edina students are actually creating um, other discussions to happen outside of Edina. I've been at a couple state-led meetings where Edina students have been featured as um, pioneers in having student voice in schools. We're going to continue to partner with teachers. Uh, teachers are the individuals that set the culture in our schools. We're also going to continue to set high expectations and make connections to those high expectations so students learn in an authentic way. We're going to figure out how to deliver our curriculum and learning um, in a more efficient way and in different ways. And we're going to intervene for students who need the interventions to help their skill development. We're also going to intervene for students who need to be challenged more. And we're also going to work on our professional development and our, uh, and our, for our teachers and our staff so that they're prepared to um, uh, manage the ever-changing world of our curriculum. There are other elements of the strategic plan I just want to touch on. Uh, one is uh, our community culture and equity and inclusion. Um, Edina schools um, will say to every student that we're expecting you, uh, we want you to achieve. You are um, part of this community, and we want to make sure that all students um, belong in this educational community. We also want to develop positive learning environments. We want to take a look at what's happening. Some of uh, Edina has got a uh, has been a leader in wellness, and social emotional um, development, and we want to make that part of our part of our strategic uh, initiatives moving forward. We also want to expand leadership not only to our staff but also to expand student leadership. Uh, Edina students are already leaders. How do we develop them and tap into their talents as leaders? And then, as always, we want to engage parents in the schools and the community to um, 
in community education, um, communicating with uh, a community that communicates in very different ways, and, and really to show the community that Edina Public Schools is a great value um, to uh, residents and citizens. So the strategic plan is all about where we are going. I want to share with you just a few fun facts about where, uh, about when we are, where we are so far this year. So the first one is called a piece of cake. I know you've all heard about last year's high school robotics team and their amazing season. So far this year, we have a middle school robotics team called Piece of Cake, who just qualified for national competition at their level. Cornelia Elementary recently received Energy Star certification from the EPA. It's the fifth school in the district to receive an Energy Star. All of these certifications are happening as a result of mechanical and roof improvements made over the past several years. Last fall, our, our first group of high school students went to Andong, South Korea. They attended school and stayed with the families of students that they hosted here last spring. Edina students have many opportunities to develop a global competence, and another has just been added. The Edina Rotary Global Scholars is a curriculum pathway offering students. Yes, there you go. This, this program is a curriculum that offers students choices in how they can hone global, global competence. Edina High School is partnered with the Edina Rotary, the Morningside Rotary, and the Edina Education Fund to not only provide financial support, but to offer mentorships and leadership training. A great example of uh, how our schools engage, our, engage and partner with the community. This, this one, this next one, did I get that? Yeah, this next one's really fun. The label of French education was presented by French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Education to Normandale Immersion School in October. It's a quality seal recognizing French dual language programs. This is, listen to this, uh, this uh, number. The label has been awarded to 285 schools in 53 countries. That's pretty prestigious. Normandale is the only school in Minnesota to receive the award. And so it stands, I mean, everybody, who knows Chris Holden, principal Chris Holden? Um, Normandale principal Chris Holden was also recognized. The Consul General of France came here from Chicago to present Chris with the Knight of the Order of Academic Palms in recognition of his outstanding contributions to the expansion of French language and culture. So we call him now Sir Chris. <laughs> Moody, Moody Investor Services has again assigned the district a AAA credit rating is the highest rating available to school districts, and Edina is one of just three in the state to have this rating. This is Steve Collison. He was named the Economist Educator of the Year by Minnesota Council on Economic Education. Interestingly enough, Steve is an Edina alum. He's been teaching economics and other courses at the high school for six years, another one of our amazing staff. The group of Southview Middle School administrators and teachers were presented the Trailblazer Award by the Institute of Personalized Learning. Earlier this month, 95 teachers and administrators from other school districts visited Southview to learn from our teachers ways that they can individualize learning to engage students. The high school was one of two public high schools in the state named to Newsweek first top 10 STEM high schools list. High school ranked 363 out of 5,000 US schools on the list. These are the four state championship teams from the fall sports season. Girls tennis, girls swim and dive, boys soccer, and girls cross country. Our students are amazing in the classroom and on the sports field. And again this year, the niche.com named Edina High School the number one college prep high school in the state. More evidence that our students graduate future ready. And I got to celebrate this with the high school band um, at the Outback Bowl and watch the Gophers win on New Year's Day where they helped the Gophers row the boat. They had an amazing experience and represented the school and the Edina community with pride. So these are just a few of the remarkable accomplishments, whoops, by students. I like that, no, that's good, keep that on. <laughs> I've always wanted to go off with music. Um, and staff so far this year, they are some of the reasons why schools are one of the first things that comes to mind when people think of Edina, is our schools and most importantly our people, our students, our staff, our community, who make the academic experience at Edina Public Schools remarkable. So I think next year when we play this game, we should be number one. Thank you.
All right, now hit it. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody, uh, and, and thank you, John. Now it's now time for our next round of Friendly Feud, and let's have Shelley Loberg and Margaret Johnson join us. Do -na 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 -na. Okay, 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 all right. All right. Oh. Let me get my questions out here. Okay, this question. <clears throat> Name a common call to Edina's 911 center. Shelley Loberg. Theft. Theft. Is theft a common call to Edina's 911 center? Oh. I'm sorry, it's not, Shelley. And that means the chamber gets to steal. Wait, that means, yes, that means the yes. chamber gets to steal. <laughs> okay, Meg Chido. You got a lot of options here. Um, what? <laughs> like all of them. Uh, name a common call to Edina's 911 center. I've locked my keys in the car. I've locked my keys in the car. Let's see if I locked my keys in the car is on the board. Give it to me. No. Peter Seidman, what do you think? Medical emergency. Medical. I have a medical emergency. I got to believe that's on the board, is it? Yes, it is. It's number one. Congratulations. All right. Mr. Skip. More cake? No. More? No, I'm just joking. Okay. Uh, I would have to say uh, fire in the house. Fire in the house? Or, uh, fire. Or Maybe just fire? There's a fire. Help, there's a fire. Yeah. Okay. Help, there's a fire. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Wow. Margaret, it's back to you. You got two strikes. You got a lot of options here. What do you think? Name a common call to Edina's 911 center. I hate to say it, but more on the domestic um, side of like mental disorders. Domestic mental disorder. Dom that covers a lot of ground. That could be there. Uh, domestic mental disorder. I'm sorry. That's not on the. That's not on the board. We go to Rotary. Tom Gump, what do you think? What do you know about 911? Noise complaint. Noise complaint. Noise complaint. Um, let's see if noise complaint is on the board. It is not. That means those 20 points go to the Adina Chamber of Commerce. Let's see. Let's see what's on the board. Let's start with number six. Suspicious person. Number five. House alarm. Number four, break in. Ah, theft is, uh, that's not quite so. Uh, you could break into somebody's house and not steal stuff. Uh, number three, speeding car. Speeding car. Number two, traffic accident. And number one, of course, medical emergency. Okay, so right now we've got the chamber at 40 points. And Rotary, I can't tell how many points are on that board. Zero. There are zero points on that board. Okay. So it's now my it's now my pleasure to introduce our mayor, Jim Hovland. Jim's going to speak about several hot hot topics in the community, including public safety, changing uh, Dinah's changing demographics, housing and traffic and transportation. And between each section of of the mayor's speech today, we're going to talk. We'll have another round of friendly feud. Jim joined the city council in 1997. He served in that role until he was elected mayor in 2005. Today, he is Edina's longest serving mayor in over 125 years of history of a city. He serves as, yeah, okay. Uh, he serves as co-chair of the Regional Council of Mayors, chair of the Municipal Legislative Commission, chair of the Transportation Advisory Board to the Metropolitan Council, and vice chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Standing Committee on Transportation and Communications. He's also a member of the leadership team of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the Southwest LRT Corridor Management Committee, and the Greater MSP Partner Advisory Council. Mr. Mayor Hovland has served on the Edina Community Foundation's Board of Directors for more than two decades and is an active member of the Rotary Club of Edina Morningside. Please help me welcome the Honorable Jim Hovland. Thank you. I was asked by uh, our former um, colleague Ann Swenson this morning at breakfast to make sure you say welcome to all those folks for me 
and then say uh, welcome to the uh, city of hockey. I understand that uh, Minnesota is a state of hockey, but we are the epicenter of hockey, so that's a, that's a wonderful thing. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, uh, public safety uh, as a continuum of the, uh, uh, the friendly feud, the family feud. Um, <laughs> And what, uh, you know, what's more critical, really, uh, to a community than public safety? And it caused me to think a little bit about, I think it was George Washington in his farewell speech, uh, talking about the things that were really important from a federal government standpoint in terms of what you're trying to accomplish for, for, for residents, for citizens of the United States. And it was keep them safe, protect them, and then provide a, uh, an environment which they, in which they can really prosper. And of course, feeling safe uh, is an important element of being able to uh, feel like you can take the time to prosper. So those two things, they, they, they transcend at all levels of government. They come right down to our level of government. Those responsibilities uh, are the same for us as they are at the federal level that George Washington talked about uh, way back in the days when he was uh, first president of the United States. We are one of the safest cities uh, in the United States. And, uh, but we are constantly facing new challenges, so we're going to talk about uh, some of those uh, this, uh, this noon. So we've got <clears throat> an increase in calls uh, that are public service related in, in recent years. Uh, we've got uh, more total minutes spent on calls by patrol and response times by the fire department. Uh, to help with that, the city has added extra staffing in both the police and fire departments in the past few years. Next month, we're going to bring on six new firefighters, uh, thanks to a federal, and these will be uh, paramedics as well. Uh, and that's thanks to a federal grant. Uh, with additional uh, paramedics and firefighters, the uh, fire department will be able to consistently staff a third ambulance on each shift. So this is an important uh, addition for our community. Because you can see that number one on the list uh, of what do you think of when you think of Edina Public Services, medical assistance calls. And, and I think... We are known for those quick response times, the police getting there quickly, and then the, the uh, emergency medical people getting there shortly thereafter. But we want to make sure that we have the most compressed time frames that we can have so that we can give our uh, residents the best chance of survival in a medical emergency situation. So um, we've also seen a dramatic increase in mental health calls. And I've been trying to get a handle on that. And, and for Senator Franz, and I don't know if this is coming up as an issue at the legislature, uh, but but as apparently across the country, people are seeing an increase in uh, mental health calls, a need for uh, mental health assistance. Uh, it, it causes me to reflect personally on, on what are the, you know, our, our police are trying to do that, and they're getting extra training to be able to do that. Uh, but should there be some other uh, people involved that are, you know, if it's a known medical emergency call, should we be having a, a force maybe regionally or a, a group that can respond to these medical emergencies uh, that involve mental health issues? Um, our, our, our police department folks, uh, as I said, they've completed a 40-hour de-escalation training course. Uh, and if you notice the other day, there was an article in the paper, uh, John Harrington, the former chief of police in St. Paul, has been leading a, a task force that's looking at de-escalation strategies where uh, you have uh, issues uh, where uh, police officials and uh, citizens are interacting. And so our, our uh, police force is really active in those areas as well. Um, before we get too far into this, I want to have everybody that works for the city please stand up because we've got a great uh, staff at the city. I want to make sure that we recognize all of them. <clears throat> So, Chief, I want to pay you a compliment this morning when I went to that breakfast meeting at Edina Grill. The police chief from Bloomington was sitting in there and, uh, and having a meeting about something that they had going on legislatively and felt like he needed to come to Edina for some reason to have that meeting. So, uh, And felt comfortable. I don't know if he called you ahead of time and told you he was coming over or not. But um, Now, another thing that, that we've got coming up here, and you've heard a discussion about this for a couple of years, uh, is the uh, body-worn camera. And we're hoping that we can get those installed this year so that by the end of this year, all of our officers are going to be wearing body-worn cameras. We've used uh, squad, uh, in-squad video cameras for several years now. Uh, and, of course, this uh, dash cam uh, footage that many of you have seen in, on television from other circumstances, it documents encounters and provides enhanced transparency and accountability for uh, everybody involved. And I think it helps you get to the truth of the situation as to what's happening. That same thing is going to be happening with body-worn cameras. They've been wearing them down in Burnsville for over a decade now, and I think they feel like 
uh, and, and believe uh, earnestly that it really helps their police department. Uh, it may be as beneficial to their police department as, as it is to the people that, uh, that they're encountering. The, the biggest challenge we've had with the body-worn cameras is how do we store all that data? If you've got our officers wearing body-worn cameras, and not only how do you store it, but what's private and what's not private? You know, if somebody gets called to a home for one of those, uh, in one of those circumstances where I think Margaret mentioned uh, there might be a domestic issue or a dispute, is that, is that going to be public information? You know, if he's got his body camera on that goes into the cloud to be stored, somebody finds out about it and come and ask about it, is that if a reporter? Is that something that can be divulged? All these questions we're, we're working on here and trying to develop policies around it. Um, and then with respect to the fire station, uh, we're looking at a couple of fire station improvements. We had a company called, uh, and get a load of this name, Five Bugles Design, uh, do a study for us. And um, our station two uh, out in um, the um, Saltdale area, which is over on York by the Y, uh, is, has some real limited uh, capability. And of course, we all know there's many senior citizens living in that area out there. And, and that's an uh, area of our community that's... Uh, having a, the most sort of a population expansion. Uh, we've got some limited capabilities there in terms of uh, staffing and, uh, and equipment, so we're thinking that we need to do something about that. There's some discussion about where that should be relocated. And then, um, yeah, because in 2019, 51% of our fire department calls came from Southeast Edina. It was just staffed by two paramedic firefighters with one rig. So there isn't enough room, as I said, to add uh, to that facility. So we're thinking about uh, relocating that facility somewhere in that Salt Hill area. And then, of course, uh, the northeast quadrant, which would include uh, the Grandview area, uh, we're thinking that if we can develop a third station sometime over the next five years uh, in this area, uh, we'll be working on that as well. So that's going to be part of our capital improvement plan. So stay tuned for more information and conversation about the future of our fire stations. So now let's turn back to our game show host. Uh, Scott Neal to uh, set us up for the presentation on housing in the community. Scott. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. You know, the, the let me get this ready. <laughs> As our contestants make their way, no, we don't. As the contestants make their way, Meg, Josh. Up here, I want to just emphasize that uh, public safety is really a, a, an important value for us in Edina, and we're proud of the service that we get from our police and our fire departments, uh, and we want them to continue providing that uh, at the level that our residents think and have come to expect and, and come to want. So it's time for our next round of Friendly Few. Are you ready? <clears throat> there are five responses on the board to this question. Name a multifamily housing development that op opened in Edina in the past five years, Meg Chido. Southdale 1? Is Southdale 1 on the board? Oh. It is not. So I'm sorry, Meg. You don't even have to say that. We'll, you get this automatically. Okay. Let's go. Okay. And the first answer is Onyx. Yes. Onyx. Let's see if Onyx is on the board. Yes, it is. It's number five. No, no, no. Paul Nelson. No. Name. Hey, 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 hey. There's no. No, 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 no. There's no conferring on this stuff. Okay. Right. Right. Paul Nelson. The Avador. The Avador. Give me the Avador. It is number one. Congratulations, Paul. Now, Tom Gump. Tom Gump. Eyes up here. Look at me. <laughs> You've watched the show, right? You know, okay, all right. So, so name a multifamily housing development, a big building where people all live together. Uh, it's opened in a dine in the last five years. That's not on there. Okay, all right. <laughs> Shelly Loberg. France 44. France 44. <laughs> France is, that is a liquor store. <laughs> but let's see, let's see if Shelly's favorite multifamily housing development, France 44, is on the board. Give me France 44, it is not. 
It's not even an Edina liquor store. Ay, ay, ay. Mr. Josh Sprague, what do you say? 7,100 France. Is 7,100 France on the board? It is not. Now remember, remember this isn't, these aren't necessarily factual responses. These are just what people said, right? Oh. All right. Chamber of Commerce, you can steal. You got a lot of room on the board, two, three, four. Name a multifamily housing development that opened in a dine in the last five years. One Southdale. No, she said Southdale one. <laughs> nope. Uh, let's see. Judges. Remember, I'm sorry. That's not, well, the judges that's not have there. proven to be the wrong. The points go to Rotary Club of Edina. Boo. Boo. All right. So, remember, these are the responses we got. They're not necessarily accurate. Okay. <laughs> There's no fact checking these. Are, these are a public opinion. All right, number two. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Number four. What's number four? The Aria. The Aria is the old, where the old Best Buy is at the corner of 66th and York. Number three. The Loden. The Loden. The Loden is out on 169 in Bren, 250 units. And finally, number two. Nolan Mains at 50th in France. So that is, uh, let's turn it back over to the mayor and he's gonna tell us more about housing developments in Edina. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So whether it's uh, Avador, uh, Nolan Mains, the Loden, Aria, uh, or Onyx, uh, these uh, are all multifamily housing developments. Uh, Avador, age restricted, 55 plus. They've all come online in the past few years. Uh, the Lorient is what I think that uh, Shelley was thinking about. Not, not ready for ocu ocu occupancy yet. The Lorient at 4,500 France and the Millennium at, at Southdale at 66 and Xerxes are under construction. Um, what we now call, we used to call it the Guitar Center, but the promenade residences uh, on the Guitar Center site will be starting this uh, spring. They were approved for construction over a year ago. And then, of course, uh, as many of you know, uh, if you read Finance and Commerce and are watching what's going on in the city, we had uh, Ryan Companies in for a sketch plan review of the U.S. Bank site at 70th and France. That was their second time in on sketch plan review. And the second time in, they had a much more comprehensive plan than the first time uh, that is much more attuned to what we're trying to accomplish with respect to design efforts uh, and livability in the city of Edina. So whether they come back with an application uh, they've gotten their input from the council and the planning commission on that. We'll have to wait and see. And then uh, around the uh, opening of um, uh, Lifetime Fitness, you know, which is the first uh, joint project of its type between Simon Development and Lifetime Fitness, uh, it's going to be a prototype that they use other, at other South uh, Simon malls around the country. Uh, that model uh, was uh, discussed and advertised on its grand opening, and then uh, Barama Karate, the CEO uh, of that organization, you know, has his, his vision, uh, and we'll talk about our city vision in a, in a little bit, but you know, his vision is to have lifetime fitness, lifetime living, and lifetime work all located in close proximity to each other. And <clears throat> They're doing this down in Dallas right now in about a 700,000 square foot uh, location pad in downtown Dallas where uh, you, know, you live, work, play within just a short uh, distance of each other with these three concepts. So when he opened Lifetime Fitness, I noticed he had a, a presentation that included his ideas of what he'd like to see for housing, uh, lifetime living, uh, on top of uh, the old Herberger site, uh, which uh, as we understand from talking to the county and Simon, uh, the idea is, and they're seeing where this goes because there's a lot of moving parts to it, would be Kowalski's on the first floor where the Herberger site is, two stories of library with a big corner entrance on the library, uh, and then above that, some apartments that would be the lifetime living apartments. And, and what, what that'll materialize into, we don't know yet, but uh, so it, it involves the county, it involves Simon, it involves lifetime, uh, there's a lot of different moving parts and then Kowalski's as well. So they've got uh, a lot of things to coordinate there. So that's 
one of the things that's kind of hanging out there as a potential project. Um, I think folks think with all this activity going on that uh, the city council tends to just kind of uh, guide all of these things that come in for approval, but uh, it's, I think because our community is an attractive place uh, for developers to come to for many reasons, uh, demographic and financial, um, we're not the ones at the city council that are driving this development. And in fact, there's a, you can see this slide. Uh, when all the projects have been looked at, uh, we've denied as many as we've approved in terms of housing units uh, because they just didn't meet our expectations in terms of what we wanted for the city. So I think that's one of the things that um, I think is important to know uh, that we're being very judicious, very careful about what we do in terms of uh, managing growth in our city. Uh, and I think this slide has some real beneficial value in, in that regard. And so as we go about uh, guiding this redevelopment, we want to get the best possible outcome for everybody that lives in our community. And we've got a lot of people that are moving into these apartments that are long time Edina residents looking to downsize or who split their time uh, between here and somewhere else. Uh, they've maybe got lake cottages, uh, they've maybe got places in warm climates. And then there are other folks, uh, you'll see this, uh, this person, her name is Jean Digman. And when you get the March issue of Edition Edina in your mailbox in the next week, uh, please be sure to read the front page story about some of the new faces moving into our community. Jean Digman uh, moved here from Iowa and she's living at Avador. And she wanted to move here because she wanted to be closer to her sisters. Uh, and young professional Jordan Greenlee is also uh, going to be shown here. Do we have a slide of Jordan? Okay, and then other folks like Jordan Greenlee who found an apartment at Nolan Mains are moving in. Uh, and then Rotarian Wuj Bayam that many of you know has told us that several people from South Korea uh, have relocated here uh, after the uh, uh, food giant uh, CJ bought Schwann's and they chose Edina to live in. And some of them are living at the Onyx and then others are scattered out through uh, single family residences and other locations. So. That's on the market rate side of things. We're also doing, as people know, things on the, uh, what we call the affordable housing side. And you know, throughout the country, as I go to these meetings with mayors in other parts of the country, everybody's facing this uh, housing affordability crisis and, and no one, it seems to me, has a real good handle on, on why we're facing this challenge after all these years of, um, uh, uh, of seeming to have a greater level of affordability for people. Uh, I had a lunch or breakfast with a fellow the other day who's now close to 90. He said, what's, what's all this about affordable housing in Edina? He said, I thought you had to achieve Edina. And, I, and, um, and of course, that's an old Gindin cartoon that we knew has been in existence for many, many years. He said, I worked hard to get here. And I said, well, uh, uh, I don't, you won't use his name, but um, Ralph. Um, <laughs> When you first moved into Edina, uh, over on Hankerson, I think is where it was, I said, who was on your street? And he said, who was living there? He said, we had a, a guy next door who sold industrial equipment. I had a guy down the street who was a carpenter. Uh, and then he named some other folks. And I said, well, you think that carpenter could still uh, buy a house in Edina when the median priced home is $550,000? You know, do we want to have uh, uh, an array of people, give them a chance to be in our community that are working, living here, People like teachers, and we're going to we're going to have one of those quizzes like that in a minute. Um, and he said, "Well, give me more information about that. I want to I want to understand it better as an issue." And he was really interested in it from a policy standpoint. Uh, and so that was an encouraging conversation I had. But um, one of the things we don't have to worry about that we're seeing around the country, especially on the West Coast, is unsheltered homelessness, and that's that's, that's an additional layer of complexity for cities like uh, Los Angeles or Seattle, Portland, San Jose, uh, they are really struggling with some of these issues. Um, San Jose is a great example, the, the epicenter of technology on the West Coast. Uh, they've got about 7,000 homeless people uh, on the streets of San Jose and when they talk about building facilities for homeless people so they have shelter, uh, their cost per door on a multifamily building is $750,000 a door. So they, they know they can't do that, who can? And uh, so what they've gone to is a pilot uh, program where they're developing a strategy of keeping people from going into homelessness. And this might be something for you to think about that the legislature, uh, 
they, they started uh, trying to figure out who was on the verge of going into homelessness with help from mental health people and other folks, uh, social services people. And so in a situation where people get divorced, now it's a single mom, the husband's lost his job, he can't provide the child support. Uh, they spent, uh, they kept 250 families out of homelessness at an average cost of $4,000 per family for that year. And, and of course, once you get into homelessness, uh, stratification, the cost of getting out of it is just enormous compared to the $4,000 that was used to protect them from getting in there. We don't have that problem. But we're looking at affordability in another way in our community, and we're trying to do this as part of our overall strategy of creating a more connected, connected and stable environment. So in the past year, we've got some uh, projects that have, uh, are either coming online or, or approved. We approved a 171 uh, unit affordable housing uh, unit, uh, these are 171 total units that, that were approved. Uh, these include two 100% affordable multifamily developments that received uh, low income housing tax credits from the state through a very competitive process. And, um, and then what we've also been doing to help build that fund, you know, we built uh, some of the affordable housing fund around uh, the, because of the Southdale uh, TIF district that we created uh, in part uh, contributes to uh, our affordable housing fund. Uh, but we've also been collecting uh, funds from developers. So in Edina now under our, our affordable housing policy, you can either, you can either put the units, uh, the 10% of the units in your building, you can do it somewhere else, or you can, uh, you can, you can buy into the program by paying $100,000 per door based on what your obligation would be on that, that, uh, uh, that calculation. So we've got um, 2.16 uh, million that we've collected so far and we've got another 1.9 million coming in, I think, from the, uh, the Guitar Center uh, project site. That'll help us uh, with some of these affordable housing challenges that we have uh, as we go about trying to figure out what to do. Uh, do we have a slide on that uh, Waldorf Nevins project, or are we just talking about them? So MWF Properties, a company called MWF Properties, is going to tear down that old Waldorf Nevins uh, building over at 70th and Cahill that uh, cleaners, that went broke, and it's just sitting there uh, empty. So we've approved a project over there, it's gonna be called Amundsen Flats, and that's gonna have 62 units of affordable workforce housing. So people will work there, some people have been saying, well those are, it's a voucher program. No, it's not, it's a, people that are working in the community that are anywhere from 30 to 80% of uh, area median income. And our area median income is about 95,000, 90 to 95,000 dollars. So you can tell that the people that are going to be living there are going to be working and they're going to be paying rent at a reduced rate. And this is true throughout our town. And then over, does it, do people know where the old Flight Time Studios are over on 76th Street? Um, right off France Avenue, just west of France Avenue off 76. We've approved a project over there with Aon and we're going to build a, a new four-story 70-unit affordable housing project over there. Uh, for families. And then uh, earlier this month, the council acting as the Housing and Redevelopment Authority approved uh, some loans uh, to the uh, Dinah Housing Foundation. Uh, right behind the vitamin shop at France and 70th is a little office building. And that's going to be purchased and we're going to turn that into a senior affordable housing, which would be a great place for them to be because then they could walk a lot of different places into the Southdale district. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that we're doing in terms of age-restricted housing, and I think that's going to be 118 units. Um, and then we're also trying to do some uh, uh, naturally occurring or uh, uh, affordable housing uh, projects with single-family properties in Edina through uh, the Edina Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and we'll rehabil rehabilitate these properties and, and keep them as naturally occurring affordable housing uh, in the community. These are harder to do. Uh, and we've done them with uh, the West Hennepin County Land Trust over the years, but we've only got about a dozen of them in town. So the next question that's coming up is, uh, who is living in these uh, affordable workforce housing units? Uh, that seems like a good question for Manager Neal. And so that's up on the next round of Friendly Feud. Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, can we have our next contestants come? Paul Nelson and Peter Seidman, join me, please. Shake hands. There you go. All right. You're ready. Peter, are you ready? Yeah, we're ready. All right. All right. <laughs> Name and occupation. It's a job, right? Okay. <laughs> of someone living in. I think it was Teacher. you. Teacher. 
Give me someone living in affordable housing. Give me teacher. It is the number one answer. Congratulations. You get to sit down. You get to try to run the board. Uh, skip. Name an occupation of someone living in affordable workforce housing. You're a real estate guy. You should know this, Policeman. right? Police. What? What? Oh, sorry. Right. You please use your microphone. This is on TV. This is live streaming oh. on, on TV. I don't know if everybody knew that. Okay. So give me your response again. I would say a policeman. A police a officer. Police a police officer. Do we have police officer? We do not. That's your first strike. Margaret Johnson. Name an occupation of someone living in affordable or workforce housing. Um, like a retail manager? Like a retail manager. Give me retail manager. It's number two. Meg Chido. Who's living? Who's living in affordable housing in Adina? What kind of what kind of jobs? What kind of occupations do they do? It's not the time where you get to confer. Um, I'm going to say like people who work um, at like a financial institution. People that work like a bank or a like credit a banker, union. A banker or a credit union. Okay, or a credit union. Uh, na somebody who works at a financial institution. No, sorry. Yeah, boo. Okay, you got two strikes. You got three answers left. You got Peter Seidman at the plate. What's it going to be? Somebody who works in the trades, the plumbers, electricians. Trades. Somebody that works in the trades. Give me trades person. Sorry. Back to Rotary. You got three responses left. And you can, this, this is where you can confer. You, can, you already conferred. And do you have a response, Mr. Tom Gump? Healthcare professional. Healthcare professional. Do we have healthcare professional? Give it to me. Yes, we do. All right. That, you win, you get the 20 points. But let's look through, uh, what's, what is uh, response number four? Server. And response number three? Teacher's assistant. Very good. All right, we are going to run one more, our final question. And this will determine who wins. And they actually win something here today. So this is, this is worth it, right? We've got, yeah, you win. Well, if you win. All right, we've got one question left. We're going to run it right now. Come on up here. Skip Thomas and Tom Gump. All right. <clears throat> Final question of the day, it's going to break a, a tie to see who is the best civic group in Edina. Spanish. Spanish? That wasn't even the question. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. That, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. No, it doesn't. All right. I got to read the question. Okay. Other than English, name a language spoken in Edina. Tom Gump. Spanish. Spanish it is. Let's see. Oh, let's see if Spanish is up there. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. That was pretty good. I'm glad you won that anyway. Okay. Moving on. Shelly Loberg. Name a language other than English spoken in Edina. Chinese. Chinese. Is Chinese on the board? Yes, it is. It's... Number four, Mr. Josh Sprague. Le Francais. Is French on the board? Yes, it is. It's number three. Mr. Paul Nelson. Hmong. Is Hmong on the board? Hmong is not on the board. Doesn't mean it's not spoken here. Just didn't make the survey. You got one strike. You got Tom Gump. What's it going to be? Somalian. Somali. Do we have Somali on the board? Yes, we do. Number two. We have two responses left. We have Shelley Loberg. Yeah, one strike. Oh boy. A language other than English spoken in Edina. What do you think? There's a lot of languages in the world. You could name Hin one. Hindi. 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 Did you say Hindi? <laughs> I'm going to go with that, yeah. Hindi. She says Hindi. Give me Hindi. You betcha. Hindi. Yeah. Number five. And we have Josh Sprague. You got one strike. You got one language left that made the survey. What do you think it is, Josh? Hmm. 
Japanese. Give me Japanese. No. Two strikes. We got one strike left. Paul Nelson. This is for all the marbles. You get this, you win. You lose this, you lose for your entire team. <laughs> Thanks. No pressure, you're saying No pressure. That. No, no pressure no. at all. Good. Um, what do you got? I was kind of thinking about saying German, but how about I go with, uh, well, I better stay with German. You better stay with German. <laughs> I was going to say Minnesotan, but... Yeah. Yeah. Better go with German, then. Yep. All right. German. Do we have German? We do not. We have... Oh boy, this is, this is so much pressure. You get this, you win. You don't get it, you lose. Oh man, this is Right, that's the rule of the game, right? Okay. All right, I will take the response from who? Who's gonna give me the response? Margaret, you are, what's the answer? Vietnamese. Their answer is Vietnamese. For all the marbles is Vietnamese number six. Open it up. It is not. So that means rotary is the winner. We're the number one civic group in Edina. Congratulations, right. Rotarians. Thank you. So, what is number six? Russian. Korean. Russian. Yeah. Congratulations, everybody. And we do have wonderful gifts for the winners and nothing for the losers, right? All right. All right. <laughs> so now, I want to turn the rest of this presentation back over to Mayor Hovland and he'll finish us out. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hubbard. All right, thank you. Thank you, that was really, uh, that was fascinating. <laughs> Good work, teams. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about changing demographics, and um, you, you know, think about it as our, if you wanna describe it as our town moving from here to there, from present to future, there's so many things that change, and we've seen those changes in the past. The types of housing people want to live in changes, the face of retail changes, Necessary services change. We've talked about some of the things that we're facing from a public safety standpoint. And buildings change. The way people want to live in buildings or the buildings you need for commerce change. And then, of course, people change too. And in Edina, we will come to look more like the changing face of America over time. We will become more diverse, more pluralistic, and uh, most importantly, I think, stronger and better for it. Minnesota itself is undergoing some major demographic changes. These include a rapidly growing older adult population and increasing racial and ethnic diversity, especially amongst the youngest people in our state. Currently, 32% of our state's youngest residents, uh, zero to age four, are people of color. Minnesota is home to a smaller share of residents of color than many other states, but we're seeing high growth of our population of color. Minnesota has seen a 29% growth in its population of color in the past 10 years, the ninth largest amongst the states. Uh, through the, uh, uh, though, this, though these statistics might not be as dramatic, we are seeing changes in Edina's demographics too, and we are committed to being welcoming and inclusive to all those who live, work, and spend time in Edina. To support and foster an inclusive community, uh, city staff members are dedicated to acknowledging, seeking out, and celebrating the diversity of Edina community members and proactively working together to eliminate systemic and institutional barriers to ensure that all people have the opportunity to thrive uh, in Edina. We have a race and equity implementation plan that's the foundational work the uh, city of Edina uses to engage and deepen racial equity work for all and was developed in, 19, or in 2018. The city of Edina is fully aware that achieving racial equity transformation is a continuous process through learning and growing from relevant historical and current day experiences and making connections to the desired future vision of Edina. Racial equity involves all members of the community and city staff strives to act and make thoughtful, intentional, and informed decisions that are fair and inclusive for all community members. Now, for almost a year, the city has had a race and equity coordinator on staff. Heidi Lee, is Heidi here today? Yeah, stand up please, Heidi. <clears throat> we feel good that she came east of the, or west of the river. She's, that was, a big, that was a big move, coming across that river uh, from St. Paul. And for almost a year, uh, Heidi's work has been focused on training, supporting the city's various work plan projects related to racial equity, and then also doing community engagement. I think many of you in this room have been uh, participating in some of those community engagement exercises. All city departments have had race equity goals the past two years. Training, data collection, and policy review was a big focus in 2019 and will continue to uh, be so this year. 
This year, we also plan to roll out a limited English proficiency policy to ensure staff are serving well our residents who don't speak English or speak English as a second language. City staff will also work this year on several wayfinding and signage projects printed in multiple languages. We'll also consider a recommendation to rename a city park in honor of black settlers and early community leaders B.C. and Ellen Yancey that you can see up on the screen. The Yancey family, one of our founders of the city of Edina. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the traffic issues uh, in our community um, and the relationship. I told you we'd talk a little bit about vision. I was down in um, uh, Orlando for two days uh, end of last week for a U.S. Conference of Mayors leadership meeting. And we had a motivational speaker there named Pat Williams, who was, uh, I think he was a professional basketball player years, decades ago, uh, was um, part of the management team of the Philadelphia 76ers, was one of the founders of uh, the Orlando Magic. And he does a lot of public speaking about uh, leadership. Uh, and his, his position is that everything rises and falls on leadership. And he described the uh, seven ingredients of leadership excellence. And as I was looking to, listening to Pat talk about uh, these seven ingredients of uh, leaders of excellence, it made me think about cities. And it made me th think that some of these same ingredients apply to cities, and especially a couple of them as pertain to Edina and the things that we've done here. And, and one of the most important things he talked about was having vision. And, and, and you, you know, it made me think about Edina and the great job we've done over all these years, regardless of who's at the city council and who's the mayor, uh, who is the staff? Uh, Edina has always had a history of looking forward. Uh, and this is true in the city as well as in the school district. They're always pushing forward and looking forward. And I think we've seen some really strong evidence of that in, in the school district's work of trying to get our kids to the point where they can take these jobs that people even, that don't even exist right now, but they're prepared uh, to be able to think their way through these things and, and, and assume these responsibilities in a, in a future economy. So... <clears throat> Uh, what he also stressed, and this is true for a city as well, I think, is that uh, what, what, what visioning does uh, for leadership in a community is that uh, you want, as a city, to be able to foresee or project what's coming. And I think Edina, as I said, has done a really good job of that because what, one of the elements of, of visioning is that it gives you focus and it helps keep you fueled for what you think you need to be doing and where you want your town to go. And it also helps you finish what you want to get accomplished. And so if you think about leadership always being about results, uh, I think you can look around our community and see, see so many great results of the things that uh, past councils and existing councils have worked on in terms of visioning, and especially true also in the school district, I think, especially when you think about the outcomes that John talked about with respect to our kids. So. And without these, without vision and without results, you, you can't you can't meet these goals that you've got. You can't produce the results that you want to produce. And then we got to be able to communicate that vision to other people and get other people to to share it and and to buy into it and get enthusiastic about it as well. So those were two of the important things I thought about in, in listening to Pat. And then that takes me back to talking about uh, traffic. And you think, well, what's the connection there? Well, it's all part of this. Uh, process of looking at land use in our community. And I think if there's a single point in our, in our community where people get uh, kind of sideways with each other, it's, well, what's the future of development in our town? What about height? What about density? You know, you've got folks that intellectually can accept it, that you need to be moving forward. They're, they've got businesses of their own. They know if you stand still, you're going backwards. You just don't know it for a while. Uh, but still, they don't want you to change or mess up what everybody loves about it, about this place. And so I think that's the goal this council, all the councils I've served on have always had this in mind. Let's preserve what we all love about Edina. But in the process, let's recognize that we have to be moving forward too because no city, like any person, deserves a better future. You've got to earn it. And so you've got to think about how you want it and, and what you want to do to try to uh, enhance the lives of your citizens as you're moving on through that, that process uh, of serving the town. And I think that's what everybody, at least on the councils I've served on, as I mentioned, has had that in mind. I've, saw, I've seen over the years very little self-interest, very little self-interest in the, in the members that have served on the city council. It's always been that underlying thought, what's best for our town? So 
One of the things that people have been concerned about with these new housing developments is that they cause more traffic and burden our public infrastructure. But that's not necessarily the case because we've got up here uh, some data uh, on France Avenue, which people think is one of the most significantly impacted streets, that shows that uh, in, 19, or in 2018, the traffic is actually less than it was back in uh, 19, uh, what is it, 1996? Yeah. And there are times during the day, I think, when France Avenue is fairly congested going southbound uh, in the PM peak. And we also know that there are, there are areas of congestion in our city itself on 50th, those through streets, 50th, 66th, 70th, in the afternoon on the PM peak, when people are trying to get home and they get frustrated with their inadequacies of the regional roadway system and they jump off and they're going through our town. Now people are saying, well, there's too much traffic in our town. Well, do you want to stop development in your town because people are getting off the regional roadway system to try to get home? It's a two and a half hour pr problem, probably in the afternoon. We're working on this problem. We're trying to help work on these regional systems that, uh, that affect us. Uh, I serve on the Transportation Advisory Board over at the Met Council, and we're working on this constantly, trying to improve that regional roadway system. And I think one of the reasons we're seeing less traffic on France Avenue is because there have been improvements on the Crosstown. There will be improvements on 494. There have been improvements on Highway 100, but it's not good enough to take care of the, of the th things that we see are happening in our community. And we've got to address this, and we will, because we've only got more people coming to this region. We're one of the only regions in the northern United States that's projected to have any growth in the future. And we're, by 2040, we're supposed to have another four or 500,000 people here. Well, we're going to get some of those people, but they're going to be out in that ro regional roadway system. And it also speaks to the need for more transit. We've got to figure out a way to move people around other than a single occupant vehicle. And so those are some of the challenges that we've got. But in the meantime, I don't think we can stop things here because of inadequacies on the regional system, because we've got to constantly be thinking about the, the benefits of some heightened density in some selected small parts of our community that don't affect single family living. As I said, preserve what's great about Edina, but make sure that we're, we're helping grow the community and help pay for what we all own together. We own this town together, that's the way I look at it. And it's our responsibility to take care of it, just like to take care of your house. And so when, when the plumbing needs to be fixed, we've got to fix the plumbing. When the roof needs to be fixed, we've got to fix the roof. If we don't do that, we don't maintain our triple, double AAA bond rating from Moody's and Standard & Poor's. It's that simple. You go into deferred maintenance mode, you're in trouble with your bond rating, and that means you're borrowing money at a higher rate uh, and, and, and putting it on the back of your residence. We're trying to keep those rates as low as we can. So what does heightened density do for you in some circumstances? If we're doing it in 7% of our land area, out in the Southdale District primarily, how does that help all of us that are living in single-family homes? Well, here's the way it helps. It, the average single-family home, the medium-priced home in Edina, 550000 might generate $5.50 a square foot in property tax. Uh, a a multi-family dwelling out in the Southdale District with some height to it might generate at least twice or more than twice that amount per square foot. I view that as a subsidy for single-family home ownership, and I also view it as a way of helping us pay for everything we own together without putting the burden on all the single-family homeowners. We're, we're, we're lucky because our town is growing in value, and that's because we're a desirable place to be. It's growing in value from a residential standpoint. It's growing in value from uh, a commercial standpoint, uh, and we're fortunate. Last year, almost a billion dollars in sales tax revenue was garnered out of, out of Edina. We've become the epicenter for high-end shopping in the whole metro area, you know, and that's only going to continue. Things like Lifetime Fitness, first of a kind, RH Mansion. Think of where RH Mansion is located. There's maybe a dozen of them in the country. New York, Chicago, Beverly Hills, um, um, Nashville, and here, Edina, Minnesota. Uh, we've got some things that are really desirable for people to have here and, and for uh, enhancing, I think, the quality of life that we have. So we've looked at some of these traffic impact studies, and we always look at that in conjunction with all these developments. And we want to make sure that we do it right, and we're trying to make sure we do that. As you can see, we're turning down as many projects as we approve. But I want to talk a little bit about micromobility. I got criticized in the Sun newspaper a few weeks ago by a person that I know pretty well uh, who thought this whole micromobility was a total joke. And I, I had expressed at a city council meeting, I just liked the, the, the phraseology, but I thought it was interesting uh, phraseology for the things that might be coming in the future. And we've, we've We've dabbled in micro-mobility uh, with these scooters, you know. We found that it didn't work for us, you know. But we tried it. 
we thought, well, we'll try it and see if it works. And it didn't work. And, and uh, we were criticized for even trying it. But I think that's part of Edina's history is we've got to try some of these things because how do you know if they'll work in your town unless you try them? So I don't mind getting criticized for, for, for that, but I don't like getting criticized for trying something uh, that might be beneficial to the community. Um, and I think most people in our town can, can see that, that you need to experiment with some of these things uh, with respect to infrastructure. And we've tried to build out, as all of you know, this transportation infrastructure in a way where we, we pay attention to not only motorized but non-motorized transportation. How people get around on foot, how they get around on bike. That's what people want now that are moving. Uh, millennials want that. If you want to sell your house, we've got to be making sure that we have a strong walkability index to the extent that we can and a great sidewalk system. So uh, we're also working on uh, expanding uh, our bike, our circulator system. We have a photo of the Clover Ride. Um, this is a system that we're running on Friday afternoons, a little circulator around town, uh, and it picks up people. It's got a northern route and a southern route. Picks up people at the senior center. You can go to Target. Uh, you can go other places uh, in the community using this uh, methodology, and there is the overlapping areas. Uh, so if you live out in that Southdale district, if you're a senior without any uh, mobility, you can get on that little bus in the uh, afternoon on Friday. Uh, and you can take it down to Target or you can go to a medical appointment, you can go get your groceries. It's, it's, a, it's a really nice experimentation, I think. And there could come a day, you know, think about this uh, as that Southdale district from Crosstown to France or Crosstown to 494, France to York, uh, becomes more of a village unto itself over time as it gets greened up and it gets more walkable. There could come a time with uh, the uh, autonomous vehicle coming where we're going to be able to create routes out there using some of this new autonomous technology where you got these little uh, micro buses that look like little toasters or the doors open on the side. It can handle people uh, that have uh, uh, disability issues. And they could, they could be programmed in a way where they stop at all kinds of places to pick people up and, and drop them off on a, on a regular schedule. And you wouldn't have to worry about the cost of labor. I see that as something that is going to be coming, maybe not in my lifetime, but coming sometime soon, uh, relatively soon. I didn't mean to leave, indicate that I was leaving relatively soon. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. That's not my choice, but we'll see what happened. happens. Um, so public safety, housing, changing demographics and traffic and transportation are some of the topics that we've been focusing on as of late. Another is citywide organics recycling, and there's a card on the table about that. You'll all, you'll all uh, be experiencing that sometime in May. And, of course, the county has told us we got to we got to cut back on our our trash, you know. We're, there's are running out of room in the landfills, and we've got to go to a, a strategy of doing the organics collection. So, um, in closing, I just want to say that you know we've joked our way through the the friendly feud today, um, and and we've kind of made light of some of the differences of the uh, of opinion in the world and and some of the divisiveness, frankly, and we've had a lot of that divisiveness at a, at a national level. And, and I have to admit that it's, uh, it's seeped into our community as well. And it's, um, it's disappointing uh, because I don't mind differences of opinion. Differences of opinion are fine. And uh, in Edina, I think, honored and honored everywhere in our country as free speech. Uh, but I think that dialogue ought to be respectful. And it ought to be uh, at a level where our civil discourse is what we seek uh, that is best embodied in respect and not derision of each other's opinions, whether it's uh, in, in person or online, as we see so much of now. Uh, for me, there's no room for we against they and no uh, me against you. Uh, the descent into the most base of behavior seems entirely too simple and easy to me. And it may be a, poss a possible flaw in our structure as human beings that we so easily accept the rumor or the negative as opposed to the positive or the polite treatment of others. The standard we should all maintain and the quest for all of us, I think, is to find the best in our character and humanity and not allow the basest of human conduct to rule the day. It is Edina's golden rule. rule. Respect each other, keep our discourse on the highest level, and be admired for it. Thank you.
And, and with that, we want to close our, our State of the Community Address. I want to thank our, our two families uh, for participating on the Friendly Feud today, <laughs> Rotary and Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank all the elected officials that are here and the staff, and uh, most important, John and, uh, and Mayor Hovland for their work and their address today. So thank you for coming. Have a great day.